Welcome everyone. Today is February 1st, 2021, and we are joined by Casey Mulligan, Professor of Economics from the University of Chicago and former Chief Economist of the White House Council of Economic Advisors during the Trump administration. Casey's research expands many areas, including taxation, regulation, social security, labor economics, etc. Casey also uh, uh, wrote recently the book, You're Hired, Untold Successes and Failures of a Populist President, and that's where we're going to start our conversation a little bit. So Casey, welcome. Welcome to Wallace Hammer Combs. Thank you. Uh, yeah, let's talk about the book a little bit to start. Um, there's, there's a lot of information there. There's a lot of super interesting uh, uh, stories. And, but from your perspective, what was the main objective? What was your main objective, the big takeaway you want the readers to, to, to get out of it? Well, when I started the project, you know, I, I had noticed how even myself, when I went to the White House, I didn't know what to expect. I mean, people weren't really saying what was happening. Um, they were saying a lot of things that I knew weren't true. I knew from experience about the Affordable Care Act and other things. A lot of things aren't true in the news, but then what is true? And I got there and I realized, wow, it, it's really interesting what's happening. People are going to be interested. And if I don't tell these stories, then nobody will. So that, that was my uh, launching point. Um, and then as I started to put together what I observed, um, you know, I saw some very strong themes there and populism being one of them. And well, what, what does it mean? A, a, a lot of people in, in academics and news don't really know what it is. Uh, they just think it's a bunch of upset people or for maybe no reason. Um, and so I try to explain what that is and it's based on real substance. Um, and it definitely motivates the president and the president understands where his support comes from. It's not from Washington DC, it's not from the New York area. Um, and he, he understood that every minute of every day um, and often reminded us you know, how he got in the White House and it wasn't from either Democrats or Republicans in terms of those who were normally politically active uh, supporting him. And so the book ends up being, it, really it's a social science uh, findings, if you will, but delivered through a bunch of stories about the president who's a very entertaining person. We can all agree on that at least. And, and so, so we, you, you emphasize populism. And so what, what will be your running definition of populism, populism then? Uh, um, You know, people are uh, who aren't normally part of the bureaucracy and making the decisions in the government and other major institutions. You know, tend to be people, in, if nothing else, by their location in the flyover country. Um, they have suffered from policy failures, real policy failures. Not a, maybe some imagined ones as well, but there are definitely real policy fa failures. Um, that aren't even beginning to be acknowledged. Um, and Donald Trump, the candidate, was an entrepreneur who recognized this and, and grabbed that opportunity to win his first election he really ever ran in. Uh, happened to be the biggest election in the world. And, you know, so it, it really, it's a, it is a class conflict. Um, but what more of the class is the people who run the institutions, maybe you want to say Ivy Leaguers, something of that sort versus everybody else. Um, but it's not an imagined conflict, um, like the Bears versus the Packers or something like that, Green Bay people versus Chicago people. It's not a real conflict between us there, but there is a real conflict um, between the, those, the, the ruling class, the Ivy Leaguers and everyone else, because there are policy mistakes that need to be fixed. The people out there in flyover country know it and they're having trouble um, getting anyone who has the power to make these decisions to actually hear. Yeah, so, so one of the, so um, you mentioned, one of the numbers you mentioned that I think is striking in the very beginning, you say that there are about 600 people in DC that are accountable to voters. And there are half a million, I think, employees of the federal government. They're like, you know, working and, and completely unaccountable and the accountability coming to them, there's like multiple layers. So, so it, it's, it's like, when you contrast those two numbers, you, you see the, the, that's sort of the 
that's what you call the ruling class, right? The ruling class, the things that they do, the things that they might, buy, might be even outside of the scope of, of, of the control of the people they are elected to begin with. And you use an example that I think is, is very strong in the, in the, in the book where, where you talk about your, the, the CEA findings on, on the impact of some policies, earlier policies by other administrations on, on, the, opioid, on the opioid crisis, on the, 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 the increased consumption of opioids and therefore addictions and, and, and deaths that came as a result of that uh, and how much they fought, the, the sort of uh, establishment in, in, in DC fought even the, those findings. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, we, we um, that was one of the president's priorities, uh, and he got that on the campaign trail. I mean, and, and people were upset that they're going to funerals of young middle aged people. Um, and he promised to do something about it. I believe his 20th of executive order, which was in the first month or so, launched some initiatives to look at that. Um, and, you know, everyone in the government, at least the political appointees who weren't career people, felt pressure to contribute to that, regardless of their field and our field being economics. Um, and we had looked at that at the University of Chicago before as, as part of our health economics research. I wouldn't say it was an emphasis, but it was something we worked on. And it became an emphasis when we got there. What, does economics have anything to say about that? Well, we look at the prices and the quantities. The quantities, that's the definition of the crisis, right? That there's so much consumption and, and deaths. Um, but what about the prices? Very natural thing for an economist to do. Um, and we looked at that and we were pretty surprised to see how much prices um, we were looking, when we're in the White House, we we're looking mostly at prescription opioid prices. And they had fallen a lot. Um, by a factor of more than five, um, partly through insurance, uh, opioids during the opioid epidemic became covered by insurance and that made them a lot of cheaper uh, in terms of out-of-pocket costs. Um, some of the major opioids came off patent. So you had opioids being a lot cheaper and that something uh, you might, if you want to understand where things are coming from, you might want to understand what's going on with really with the supply of opioids. Um, and that, you know, the insurance part was from the government. Uh, number one, Medicare, it's called Part D. Um, Medicare is our federal program, massive federal program for elderly people's health insurance. Um, it did not cover prescription drugs for most of the history of Medicare until 2006 and then that created coverage for elderly people and it covered pretty much all uh, pharmaceuticals uh, including opioids and part of what happened was um, with opioids being so cheap to the senior citizens they would bring them home uh, in huge bottles <laughs> even though they might only needed three or four they come home with a bottle of 90 and sit around the house, maybe the grandson would take it, maybe the cleaning lady would steal it. You know, some of these older people, small fraction, but some of them would sell them. Um, and those who sell, as in any market, there are a few who do the selling and they do massive volumes. And so one thing that was observed, and we noted this in our report that as you look, when we created that program, you look at the elderly, uh, the counties with more elderly people and therefore more people eligible for the program, you found deaths going up among non-elderly people. So beware you diffs and diffs. <laughs> the people off the program aren't your con control group. Um, and the people, uh, the Medicare, that program was created in the Bush administration. And um, some of the veterans of that who were very proud of the program, and it's an amazing program in, in a number of ways, they were running Trump's health department and they did not want to talk about the contribution of their program that they were proud of to fueling the opioid crisis. So we had a lot of battle that I write about in chapter four, um, being even allowed to say in public what I just told you. And, that, and that's the, the sort of uh, 
the ruling class fighting, right? The, the, the notion that the people internally like, well, no, we can, we can be blamed, even though we have now data and indications of, of those policies. I mean, potentially there's positive aspects of it, but there's negative aspects of it. Not be willing to engage in those and trying to fix those. It's not that they didn't want to fix it, right? But they just didn't want to own it. The fact that- you can't, you can't fix what you don't acknowledge. Right, right. You know, another example of this um, was, I mentioned the president's executive order early in his term. They created a commission. Um, and that commission also took a look at, well, how is the government contributing? Um, that Chris Christie ran that commission. And it found the government contributing in some other ways for, especially there were, they had created subsidies for doctors um, who prescribed more opioids. Essentially what, the way it worked is if your patients, when they left the hospital and they responded to the survey and they weren't happy with the pain management, then you wouldn't get this subsidy. And this was a multi-billion dollars a year program. Um, and doctors quickly understood, you send home people with a nice bottle of opioids and you'll get a good grade on the survey and you'll get a lot of money. Um, that, that started around 2002 or three. And the Chris Kitsky Commission was in 2017 and it recommended, let's get rid of that. <laughs> we had many years without that program and let's try not having it anymore. And the bureaucracy very much fought back. And I, I point out in the book, I point to, to the page of the Federal Register that nobody reads, but there is the bureaucracy fighting back, saying that, you know, the president told us to get rid of the subsidy, but we don't really think it had any effect. Um, totally defying economics, that when you subsidize something, you get more of it. Um, so they definitely fighting back to this day. Um, yeah, and, and uh, uh, the you, you mentioned that deadline, the, you call it in the book, the 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 Samaritan's dilemma, right? And you subsidize something, you get more of it. You, you mentioned that line in the book multiple times. And I think that's uh, also something that I'm gonna talk in a little bit more about the fact that it seems that forgetting those basic basic ideas that are unquestionable in, in our circles that, well, demand curves are negative sloping and, and, and you make it cheaper, people are gonna consume more of it. Whether to make it cheaper through a subsidy, whether to make it cheaper directly by, 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 by you know, providing incentives for the for the doctors to prescribe more, there'll be more of it. Um, and it's, it seems that, that that type of thinking is not necessarily all that present in policymaking uh, um, these days. And did you find that when you get in? And I guess one of the one of the things that you discuss a lot about is the fact that that there's a lot of myths around around um, thinking through regulations in the federal government. Um, the myth that that let's, let's go there. Let's just describe the myths that you that you describe in the book. The three myths of federal, federal regulation. Yeah, the uh, one of the th things that I were really the primary thing I dedicated my time to there was analyzing regulation. The president was doing so much on regulation and it people aren't really aware because there's so many. Each one is kind of small. It's not like the tax law. There's one law got lots of attention. Well, regulations, there's literally hundreds, if not thousands of the flow. <laughs> Forget about the stock. And the, uh, so I was dedicated to that and, and I try to use some modern techniques, computing power to try to wrap my mind around these hundreds. One of the things I found, and I'll confess, I had kind of drank the Kool-Aid by reading the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. When they talk about regulation, they always had a picture of a smokestack as if all regulation or nearly all regulation is about the environment. And so the number one myth is that's not true. In terms of the new regulations, let's say regulations that came about in the 21st century, very few of them, let's say 10, 15% are environmental. Among the regulations that the president was removing or reforming, again, very small fraction uh, were environmental. They got all the publicity, and but the, that's very small fraction. And I'm not just counting absolute regulations. You also look at the costs and benefits of these regulations. Very small fraction of those costs and benefits are environmental. Um, if I had to name the biggest ones, 
Food and Drug Administration, which I think everyone can agree with me now. When I was writing the book, we didn't have COVID, but the president was trying to get to reform the Food and Drug Administration so that products could get to market more easily and more cheaply. That's in something incredibly valuable, but even before COVID. And now that we got our vaccine so quickly, we can all agree, yeah, that, that's, that's much more valuable than anything you could do with fracking regulation. Um, regulation around the internet, that uh, net neutrality and some of these privacy regulations were making the internet more expensive. Uh, and the president got rid of that. That's worth a lot. We, we spend a lot on the internet. Uh, I, most families, even ones who are low income, commonly have three internet connections, uh, three contracts with made with a cell phone, another cell phone and at home. And making that cheaper and better is, is very valuable. And again, way past any kind of fracking regulation. And again, in COVID, maybe you didn't notice, but if we had net neutrality, I'm not sure Netflix would have been working at. You know, with having investment in the capacity of our internet for several years before this pandemic came along really made it nice for, for us to be able to continue some semblance of living through uh, virtual means like we're, we're doing now. The Europeans didn't have such an easy time because they do have something like uh, net neutrality, uh, generally heavily regulated internet. So that's the first myth. The uh, second myth is that um, regulations are made smart by, by career bureaucrats who are looking at the costs and benefits rather than the politics. Maybe they're not looking at the politics, but they're not looking at the costs and benefits. Essentially, all the regulations, and there are a few exceptions, and they happen to be environmental ones, so it intersects with that other one. I think the environmental regulations end up in court, so they, they do have to look at costs and benefits. But again, you look at these regulations that I mentioned, the FDA, the uh, um, internet, there's no notion of opportunity cost. Um, to them, the cost of regulations is just the paperwork. How long does it take you to read? Uh, and the, I think the example I, I like to give is the stay-at-home orders. Your, your governor makes a two-page stay-at-home order and you have a small business. How long does it take you as a small business owner to read that order? That's the cost and that's it. That's all, there's no opportunity cost. And it, you know, that's a joke. It takes the small business owner maybe 10 minutes and his, he's an important guy. So we'll call his time's worth $100 an hour. It's just a few bucks cost. That's what they do when they, when they calculate what their regulations are gonna cost the people. Um, and then the third, Myth, um, trying to remember what I put third. Another myth I talk about is that regulations are good for the poor and they're not. But you mentioned you mentioned that the, 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 the myth that the burden of paperwork is part of the, it's, it's a big, it's a big. Oh, part. yeah. Okay. So I folded two myths into yeah. one there. Yeah. <laughs> so the, yeah, that the, the costs are primarily paperwork. So they might create a regulation that forces you to interact with the government on computer and they'll call that deregulation. <laughs> Even in the Trump administration, I do that and I would complain and say, you're forcing somebody to do something. That's, that's a cost to them, but oh, there's less paper, right? Because it's on a computer. <laughs> so that's deregulation, right? <laughs> um, so so that, 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 that sort of loops back to, to something that, uh, I mean, the, the, particularly the second myth, the fact that, that there's this notion that somehow the ruling class, the bureaucracy, there's 500,000 people involved in the government. Uh, are taking seriously the, the, the idea of when they're writing a rule, they're doing the cost benefit analysis necessary to understand the trade offs that th that rule is imposing to people. And, and, you know, your experience was that very little of that takes place, if none. Um, and, and you have an example in the book that that is, is disturbing in a lot of ways is the is the um, the rebate rule. That was trying. There was an attempt by by HHS to to change a particular rule of how, basically, to to stop um, um, negotiation between businesses, businesses being the pharmaceutical companies and the insurance provider on providing rebates to customers on on certain drugs. We don't have to go into the details of what that is, but the point that that relates to, to here is that there was something that HHS was trying to do that had obviously a huge cost benefit associated with it. Prices might go up, prices might go down, um, uh, maybe more access to drugs are gonna be available or not. But that process you describe in detail and, and 
there is like multiple attempts to bypass what even CEA was doing as a set of economists. They're better trained in providing the type of input, right? Once the bureaucracy noticed that, well, no, I don't like that answer. I don't like your cost benefit analysis. I'm gonna go find my own. Um, that's scary. <laughs> <laughs> that's, and, and it's again, it's very typical, um, you know, that, that, that rule. At first, when I got there, I, I was worried, you know, how am I gonna teach opportunity costs and things like that. And I quickly realized, I don't have to teach it. It's already, there's already a manual for how to do government regulation that's actually very well written and very economic sensible. It's called Circular A4. And it talks about opportunity costs. And it says things like, you know, price control, be careful. You know, your standard of proof ought to be higher for a price control because you're, you're really interfering with the, the market and how information flows and things like that. And that rebate rule is a price control. Um, and, but they just don't follow it. I mean, they totally ignore it. Um, and, and I just kind of made my job, it's just regulation meeting after regulation meeting. I said, can we follow your own rules? I understand I'm new to the building, but you have this 20 year old set of rules that you say you follow, let's follow it. Um, and it worked for a while with the rebate rule where the, the president did uh, have it withdrawn. After I left and after uh, Tom Phillipson left, who have worked with me on that, um, the bureaucracy brought it back. So it actually is a rule now. I'm kind of interested to see what President Biden does with it. Um, the pharmaceutical companies love it because it doesn't pretty require nice. them to give discounts to customers anymore. And I think Biden is pretty well supported by pharmaceutical companies. So I'm, I bet that rule will stay, but we'll see. So, all right, so go back to the Chicago school here. And, and I think that, you know, uh, the, 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 the Samaritan's dilemma is like a staple of the Chicago price theory and the sort of the entire tradition of a, of a school of thought that you're clearly a very strong representative of. Your time in CEA was very much, you, you mentioned that a lot in the book. Oh, this person had a Chicago PhD, this person had a Chicago PhD. So clearly that's something that, that feature intensively in your experience at CEA, uh, that particular way of thinking. And, and and you know, people that might listen to this might think, oh, there's different ways of thinking in the sense that there is a, a it's more mostly a set of preferences. Oh, you have a preference for this type of tool, somebody else has a preference for a different type of tools. And to the extent that it's true, that that is right, that there is some 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 truth to that. Uh, but there are some things that are they're almost like scientific to a point where it's akin to an engineer questioning gravity. Um, and and the Demand curves downward sloping is something that, yes, we can find examples of things that are not like that, but there are exceptions to that rule. Just like you mentioned, price controls, like, yeah, you can find examples where that might be appropriate, but the, the proof of, the, of, of, and when you say that, that in previous CEA's reports to the president, the economic report to the president, you know, the word marginal is not mentioned. The, the supply demand analysis are, 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 are just non-existent. So you have, I think you, you say that you, 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 your, your team had something like 17 supply and demand analysis uh, during uh, one year, whereas Obama White House had over eight years, like one. Um, I'm a, I have a hard time understanding what are the economists, they're not your team or the team that in this particular situation that we're doing. What it is that they're using as far as tools? Are they just there to justify choices that the politicians are making? Or yeah. are they really honestly trying to assess scientifically the cost benefits of certain choices? And but they just as use a set of tools that clearly are not, you know, what people educated in Chicago would do. Well, yeah, I mean they're the, there to support the <laughs> their person who appoints them. Uh, but it's also true with me. Uh, and I, I explained early in the book how. I was asked to work in the Bush administration a couple times. And there were different obstacles to making that happen. I mean, it's not ever easy. And but one was, I'm not sure I can support. I, I, I'm not a fan of privatizing Social Security. I was not a fan of the Iraq war uh, based on my economic analysis. I'm not talking about any kind of extracurricular interest I may have, which I do have, but the, the, it was based on that. and. Whereas President Trump was one of the first presidents in a long time where the basic staples of economics are very supportive of much of what he was trying to do. Not the rebate rule, <laughs> not some other things, but it was very supportive of so many things he was trying to do. Um, and so it's not an accident we had so many Chicago PhDs in the building. They, that 
economics in general was very supportive of this president, but since this president was undoing a lot of what the previous president was doing, was not be supportive. So that you know, President Obama would want to appoint somebody who would not be too quick to think about, oh, when you subsidize something, you get more of it. That this just can interfere with their daily workflow. So I, I think that that is a uh, definitely. Guess, a, but, but but I guess I guess my uh, my uh, uh, um, and maybe I'm being naive on on. You come in, you have a set of ideas, you're trained in a particular way, and the questions, that, the, the way you're addressing questions are using those set of tools, and, and, and those set of tools gets the answers, right? What I'm trying to understand is that, is that when you have a set of economists sitting there, and sure, and a, a policy comes in, and they have a reason to, to, to put the policy, there's a political reason, there's whatever choice they have to put a policy in front of the, and that doesn't have to be the Obama group, say the Bush group, or whatever. Um, are the set of economists in the room like, well, let's forget about what we know scientifically and just try to try to find whatever tools are available to justify this? Or are they like, oh no, well, no, our set of tools will say that that this is a bad idea, therefore we need to walk away and let them find some other set of economists. When 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 you see economists going around saying, Yeah, I'm not worried about a $15 raise to the minimum wage, are they being true to their discipline? Or are they just trying to find like, you know, is motivated reasoning? Say well, no. Right now, I think it's okay, and 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 see what I'm saying. I, I well, I, mean, I, I know I, I'm asking you to impute in the, on the profession, but but it, I can it, tell it, you how it goes down. And then that, so for for example, you know, I wrote a book about Obama's stimulus and how it was subsidizing unemployment, and, and I asked Austin Goolsby, who was at the CEA at the time, who was chair for part of that time and member for another part. I'm like, what the heck are you doing? We you just multiplying using a multiplier and ignore all the microeconomic incentives. What are you doing? And he said, well, that project was Christina's because she was the macro. So there was the division of labor. They gave it to macro. And I guess there's parts of macro that don't think when you subsidize something, you get more of it. Um, I think Romer might say, well, this is an empirical question. You're going to measure empirically. I don't care what the theory says if it's not fitting the data. Um, and she used a multiplier analysis and she was epically wrong. Um, you know, in the current administration, the uh, Cecilia Roos is, is very solid, um, but it's not an accident that the two other members of the CEA are not really from, from our professor discipline. Uh, you know, I think Jared Bernstein has a sociology PhD or something like that. So he's not gonna be, too quick to say, oh, demand curves slope down. And he does not demand and supply curves, not something he really uses. He might use the word sometimes. Um, and then Bushi would, would be the other one. She has economics training, but not in the standard circles. Um, and it's not an accident that, that, that those are the type of people that are appointed. So that's one way it goes down. There's kind of a division of labor. Um, you know, the, the other way that it goes down is it means you're so busy, you, you kind of pick up, pick up on the things where you can contribute the most instead of dragging down your boss. Right. Your boss has a lot of tasks and you say, oh, boss, give me the tasks that I can be helpful on instead of the ones I got to kind of, you know, ruin the party. Um, and a lot of that also ha may happen in private. So for example, with the, with the tariffs, we did write about the tariffs and our washing machine, the quantity of washing machines went down, the price went up. You can see our publications of that, um, but there was more in private that went on. So when, we're, when senators would come to talk about the tariffs, you know, Hassett um, was our leader and, and took on that. He would give the kind of standard econ analysis of that. And then Navarro would be there to um, provide another point of view, if you want to call it that. So, so that's another thing that happens. It, the, the advice gets given in private and rather than public if it's critical. Yeah, I guess, I guess that's a good point to, 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 you have two topics in the book that are topics that, I don't know, as, as, a, as a, somebody like me would always, you know, that was maybe most critical of the Trump administration was on the, the stance on immigration and trade. Um, and, and you do provide actually a very econ nuanced view of those two even policies in a way that I think most even Chicago economists would not necessarily go there and think in those terms. And they would maybe brush it off and not think about like, well, you're raising the price of something that you think you should have a price anyway, right? 
uh, uh, when it comes to immigration. And in the in the in the in the in the um, in the terrorist point, just like you were saying that we do this through quotas all the time. Even free trade administrations were doing this through quotas, and that's something that is way more uh, problematic as as a, as a, to the markets than 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 the the tariffs would be. So. My, I guess my point is that there's ways to justify even that th those two ideas that they might not. I don't know. Tell tell us a little bit about that. I think that that's. that's and I don't know about justify. Maybe a bit context. Part. When I wrote the book, I was out of the administration, so I yeah. was had more freedom to say as loudly as I want. I mean, I, we talked about all these things, but um, I could give it more emphasis when I was gone. Just context. What's historical context? I mean, politicians use words, but. I got a newsflash for you. The words they use aren't always matching their actions. <laughs> uh, and I saw so I compare Ronald Reagan, who was an actor, by the way. I love Ronald Reagan. <laughs> but he said these beautiful things about free trade, but it wasn't what he was doing. Um, I wish he and Trump were doing what Reagan said, but neither were. Um, and really, some of the worst tariffs that we have have been in my entire lifetime, the chicken tax, 25% tax on imported pickup trucks. There are no imported pickup trucks because of this. Most cars in America, although not any sold in Washington, DC or in New York are pickup trucks. Um, this again, another example, one of these policy failures that the flyover America suffers from, uh, the chicken tax. And then the Jones Act is a, it's even worse than a high tariff. It's a prohibition uh, on foreign ships or crew moving cargo along the coast of our United States. So as a result, there's no way in the world to move natural gas from the parts of America that have it to the parts of America that have cold winters. Uh, you can't do that by boat, it's, it's prohibited by law. So these are restrictions on international trade that are much, much more costly than 10% on Chinese goods or whatever got all the attention. Um, yeah, the John, Jones asked, the, asked that there's two, two things I want to point out there. You, you use an example that is incredibly powerful of folks in Massachusetts consuming natural gas. Natural gas comes from Russia, to Massachusetts, as opposed to going from Texas to Massachusetts, right? Because you don't have ships that fit. There's no, there's no Jones Act, Act fit, uh, 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 compatible ships that can take natural gas from Texas to Massachusetts, which would be a third of the price than bringing it from 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 uh, from, from Russia, and then there are Jones Act well, there are ships that can take the, the gas from Texas and send it elsewhere in the world because that's an international yeah. route. I mean, it's just that's just ludicrous <laughs> that we have that restriction, and 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 you know it's something that hasn't is around since 1915. Is that correct? Yeah, and it, it, this is one of these. No, uh, it, it's actually had a hundred year birthday last year. So it was 1920. 19, okay, okay. Uh, yeah. There was a predecessor to it called the Merchant uh, Marine Act, I think of 1915, that also was was, was involved. But the, um, yeah, this is, this was frustrating to me. I, mean, I was in the White House and then my colleagues back in academia are just totally tearing us apart for, oh, you're an administration that has tariffs on Chinese goods you know, you're going to burn in hell. I'm like, where have you been on these terrible, terrible tariffs that have been around your whole lifetime? Are you even aware of them? You probably don't buy a pickup, so you're not. But this is, you know, you, you want to fix the big problems. Um, yeah, you don't want to introduce smallish problems, but you don't want to, you would like to fix the big ones. And President Trump worked on the Drones Act. That's part of what I discussed in the book. I mean, the bureaucracy beat him back. But he worked on that. Um, and I think he eventually will get there on the Jones Act. And he also worked on the chicken tax. Um, and cutting either of these by a small, what would seem like a small amount would be incredibly valuable to the American consumer and worker. So let's talk about some some uh, numbers here that I think it's, it's again, if we talk about the economic profession and, and um, in terms of understanding what happened in the last four years, for example, uh, so the last four years, we experienced the highest, the fastest increase in medium housing, household, household income in a very long time. So real medium household income went up before 2020, before the pandemic hit by like $5,000, I think, per household. That's almost like a 10% increase. It is something, you know, if you look at the, the graphs are like, you have this, you know, sort of like change in derivative that's just very clear. 
4,000 of that came up in the very last year between 18 and 19. It was this big shot up, right, uh, between 18 and 19. And so you, you have a lot of numbers in the book talking about what, you, what CEA was estimating the result of some of the policies that were put in place. So what, how would you break down that number in terms of uh, policies that were put in place that led to that? Because whatever we did, you did there, hopefully those things we can keep doing it so that, you know, <laughs> there's nothing more important, I think, than raise medium household income. Um, and if the, the thing focus on the big things, right? So what are the big things that, that you see uh, responsible for that giant growth? Well, yeah, that particular number, um, I would put it, there'd be three or four pieces to it. So one piece I think would be a measurement error. I, I think part of that big jump, and again, I'm just the Bayesian in me says, when you have a big change, um, part of it's probably measurement error. Um, and there's some issues, you know, that the, the activity occurred in 2019, but I believe they did some of the measurement during the pandemic and, you know, are you tracking down the sample and all that? So I'd say measurement error would be part. Uh, the, the tax law is important um, and especially that's a median number. So it, it's kind of weighting the middle class more compared to averages, which would put a lot more weight on the highest income people. And there we, we knew that, you know, blue collar wages were increasing a lot. And it's what we expected, you know, from bringing our business tax rate into line with the rest of the world. Um, it's what it happened. The timing is, is right. The types of workers it was affecting was right. Um, and then deregulation would be another part. Um, there was a lot of labor regulation that got removed. Um, and then regulations on consumer products, which go into the CPI that allows us to calculate the real median household income. So th those are kind of some, kind of the pieces, and there are probably other factors. So I said four. Fourth one would be you know other factors I haven't named, but I think those certainly those first three need a close look. You, you, you I think the the book mentioned something like your overall estimation of the the impact of the deregulation exercises that took place in the last four years was something about $4,000 in, I think that was the number you came up with, right? Annual income, yeah, Annual once income. all the regulations took effect. So one of them, um, the single biggest one out of hundreds, so it's still not a majority, but it's the single biggest would be the, um, you know, backing off the auto regulations you know, saying, you know, it's okay if there are some cars on the road that aren't electric, <laughs> something like that. That's something incredibly valuable, but that wasn't going to go in until 2025, 2026, 2027. Um, and now Biden may end up putting it in, but so the, these regulations, and, and for good reason, I mean, they take some time um, from the time you write them to the time they go into effect to the time that the consumer experiences it. Many of them do. Now there are some, we gave examples and they're not trivial. The internet is something that went in immediately. Internet prices dropped like a rock in March, 2017. The very same time that the president and the Congress was working on that. Prescription drug prices, they took within about a year um, of opening entry, especially into manufacturing generics. We saw drug prices coming down. So there's some that were immediate, but others that were would have played out over a period of time. Just uh, uh, you mentioned the, the drug, the drug um, prescription drug decrease. Uh, uh, there was a episode that you described where um, you know the number CPI. You, you you have a read on the CPI numbers before everybody else does, right? In the White House, and and there was you saw the effect of the regulatory reform that was put in place that would decrease cost of prescription drugs, and that was there in the CPI in front of you. Uh, like lowest number, I can't remember the comparison set, but it was something like a, a big decrease relative to the, you know, the history of the CPI on that on that category for a long, long time. And 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 yet, I mean, the the sort of like media filter on that information is just unbelievable. The fact that the CPI was no longer, you know, evidence was was deemed fake news uh, right away, just because orange man said it, therefore it's bad and therefore it cannot be true. It's unbelievable uh, that episode. But but um 
And again, I think the episode of like, I think most of my colleagues here, most of our students, most of the people that read the New York Times or even the Wall Street Journal might not be attuned to the, to the, to the effects of those policies in economic growth and, and, and household income. Uh, over the past over the past four years, and that's 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 sad because not because of whatever giving credit to anybody, just that well I hope those policies are stay in place so that you know this can continue, right? Um, anyway, so sorry, this is a rant just on <laughs> on on that on that uh, on the media, but yeah, that, that was eye opening to me. Uh, and the orange man didn't say it; I said it. It went on his Twitter, therefore it became a lie. That's right. <laughs> And you know, they said that we were using the CPI to measure prescription drug prices, which is very standard, of course, way to measure prices in various industries and for the whole economy. Um, and this is something we were using even before the good news came. It's not something we cherry picked. And the headline that was in New York Times, the headline that was in the small town newspaper where I grew up was, President claims drug prices fell based on no evidence. <laughs> That's, I mean, how could they lie anymore? But yeah, you know, and, it, and it's not new either, right? That's not new either. I think, in the sense that, in the sense that, one of the episodes that that I, I particularly frustrated with is that I'm a statistician. I really like to think about, okay, you make a prediction today. I want to evaluate the quality of your predictions on a sequence. And you had over the Obama years, every single economic agency were making predictions about growth that were out basically that did not materialize. They were above the actual data for eight years in a row. And now during the Trump years, you have the reverse. Is that, is that by chance? <laughs> this is something at, some, at some point you start believing this is not by chance, it's by design, right? right. Um, yeah. I mean, and, we, theoretically, we expected that with our approach, you know, our approach is saying that things like adding costly regulations will something that will bring down growth, removing them, or just stop adding them will bring up growth, removing them will bring up growth even more. And if you have a forecaster who's not paying attention to that regulation, then yes, they will over predict while the regulations are put in and under predict while they're taken out. Um, and it's a fact that these forecasters do not pay attention to regulation for macro forecasting. You know, somebody like Zandi, he's not opening the federal register ever uh, to look at what's being written in there, what's being foisted upon people. He has more macro approaches if you want. He's looking at aggregate time series. Um, the Congressional Budget Office, the Federal Reserve, they're not looking at internet regulations, uh, labor regulations. If they are, they never say a word about them. <laughs> um, so, so that's the theory would say they would be surprised. And then the facts show that they were surprised. Right, right. Um, all right, let's let's move to to something you wrote during uh, but during the campaign. You you has Kevin Hassett, the former the former uh, uh, I think chairman of the, the the Council of Economic Advisors, and some others wrote a a, a, a projection of the impact of uh, the Biden's agenda on the economy. And so, what are the three things that you there, there are three things that you listed there uh, as potential things that would reduce. I'm going to read it here, basically. Um, it would reduce uh, uh, GDP going forward. It would be the reversal of the 2017 tax cuts, the reversal of the regulatory reform, and expansion of subsidies, in particular, in health insurance and clean energy. Those are the three things that are the sort of drivers of the, of the report. Um, and the assessment being that over the long run, the combined effect of that of those, those uh, policies would lead to an 8% decrease in long run GDP growth, like uh, not not eight percent decrease, but like met less than what it would have been, and with a six thousand five hundred uh, real household income decrease by twenty thirty. So that that's the those are the numbers. So like a big potential uh, decrease in potential GDP growth essentially. Um, of those, when you look now and now we have a Biden administration taking place, what are the what are the, the main sort of uh, uh, worries you have in terms of the things that you think are more more uh, likely to materialize in terms of policy? And what are the one of those? What are the ones that you, you really were being very costly? Um, you know, that's a bit more of a political question that I thought about, but I gotta confess, this is the amateur part of my brain working. But they, um, I mean, the energy one is just so costly. You know, the idea that number one, essentially, all the cars will have to be electric. So we're all going to be plugging in cars, which is going to 
be a big demand for electricity, right? At the same time, we're gonna eliminate 70% of the ways we have of making electricity. Uh, it's hard to think of a dumber idea than that. Um, and I have enough faith in the political process that the people harmed. Yeah, the people in a flower country are, are ignored too much, but if you make them scream enough, they will be heard. So I, I, I'm kind of optimistic that that won't happen. Not, and I can't say I've seen any concrete moves of that type other than Manchin, the kind of pivotal senator saying that he's not in favor of this Green New Deal stuff. Um, I'm not sure I've seen the Biden administration do anything to acknowledge that their plans are overly ambitious. Um, probably the more likely one would be the, the health insurance, um, making Obamacare subsidies even bigger. I mean, they're already massive, but he wants to make them even bigger. And of course, they're means tested and employment and employment tested. So it's another subsidy for people who either have low income or don't have a full-time job. And that, that, that basically adds on to um, the things that you wrote about during the Obama years, right? That you're just basically getting people not to work, right? So you're providing more subsidies for people not to work and that's gonna be a huge source of, of, of a slowdown in growth as a result. Yeah, especially uh, full-time work yeah, now that uh, it tends to f hit lower skilled people. So that Obamacare policy will affect GDP. I mean, because low skilled people do contribute to GDP, but their contributions may be less than proportional, maybe by definition of low skill. Um, but it will show up a lot in the full time employment numbers because those are more democratic measures of economic activity, right? Right, and and at the same time, and at the same time, if you if if the push to a, a, a much higher minimum wage, federal mandated minimum wage, that might be those numbers might be pretty big, right? Again, the the minimum wage of fifteen dollars an hour might not have that that big of an impact on GDP, but it will have a big impact on low skill employment. Um, I think that's that's I don't know. Would yeah. you Give me that assessment. You know, price controls you need to look hard at, and, and a minimum wage is a price control. It's way out of whack. I mean, it's more than doubling, right? So at least in the states that are still kind of at the federal. Um, and that'll have a lot of costs. Whether the costs show up as unemployment or not, I, 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 I'm not firmly committed to, uh, on that. I'm not sure the theory points me that way. Um, I want to know more how it's implemented. You know, it could well, let me, let me understand it. What, what, what do you mean by the theory doesn't point you that way, that that a higher price control in this situation wouldn't lead to less demand? Well, because first of all, the out of a job is not a commodity. So I understand if you fix the price of gold, that's some number that's different than what is trading in New York today, you're going to find either massive amounts or a huge shortage. But jobs aren't a commodity. So we say $15 an hour. Well, other aspects of the job of which there are many, many aspects of a job other than its wage can change and will change. Right. Um, you know, it, it could be something as simple, well, we just don't have jobs in rural areas anymore. We put them all in urban areas and make those people commute. It, it could be that. Uh, presumably it'd be a combination of these things. Um, and, and when it gets that high, probably, all these things, so it would be employment and other things. But I think it's a mistake to sit obsessed too much with the employment because that's only one way the cost will, one of the symptoms of its costs. And there'll be other symptoms, even holding employment constant, there will be costs. And um, one of the, it seems to be one of the easiest things for the agenda to, to pass on is gonna be some sort of repeal of the, the tax cuts. I think that's, they need 50 votes in the Senate only to do that. Um, so raising the corporate tax, that's, I, I'll be shocked if we don't see that happening in the next year. Um, I'm more optimistic than you. Um, really? You know, the, we were out of line with the rest of the world. This was something Democrats acknowledged. Right. Are we going to go back out of line with the rest of the world? If it's just repealing it now, if it's rewriting oh, okay. it to- wait, wait, well, wait, 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 raising it, right? I don't think it goes back to 35, but it goes back to- 28 or something like that. Yeah, raising it, then I, I could see that, that it would be an easier lift politically, I would think, to, to raise it, but not just repeal. Now, I don't know in terms of the 
mechanics of the legislature, what, whether repealing is easier than rewriting that, that right. I don't know. But from, from, from your analysis in CEA, what is that, how, how, how relevant that particular decision was, right? How impactful, I mean, I, I sort of like can think about the channels, but, but, uh, uh, I don't know, do you, would you have a ballpark number of, of the sort of like the, what is a 1% increase there tells us in GDP, for example? Um, well, I think we found the, there's a lot in the tax law, but the corporate rate part of things, um, going from 35 or six down to 21, I think is where it went, that that um, would raise wages in the long run, which we think you get to the long run in five or six or seven or eight years, pretty close. I mean, it's a dynamical system, so you never get there, but you get close. Um, and the wages would be about three or $4,000 per worker um, per year. So that that's the, the kind of effect that we projected and that partly because more businesses will be created and then the more, or businesses will get bigger and they'll need more employees. So, but also the productivity. I mean, the, a lot of the capital is pretty severely misallocated. There's way too much capital in housing relative to business. And so by narrowing that differential. Um, and due to taxes, that, that's been right. One of the yeah. reasons due to taxes, right? Yeah, taxes is a big reason for that. So narrowing that differential just made productivity, even if you had no uh, effect on, on that amount of capital, just allocating it better means it'll each unit of capital will deliver more value. All right, let's 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 close it up by talking about the pandemic a bit. And we didn't we mentioned a couple of things early on, but uh, uh, two things I wanted to to ask you. You wrote a, a blog post a while ago uh, saying I think the title was "How Economics Help End the Pandemic." Um, Describe that a little bit, because there's, there's two episodes in particular that I think are very, very influ influential and people would be nice for people to pay attention to. Yeah, we, um, and it, I think what I wrote in that blog was about really the entire profession. I want to give the University of Chicago a lot of credit, Sam Peltzman, mm -hmm. many, many years ago, writing about how the FDA um, slows and or and sometimes totally prevents valuable products from reaching the marketplace. Um, Milton Friedman pushed on that, a number of us at Chicago, but also outside of Chicago. And I think I gave examples in that blog of course. Peter Temin had a book about it from MIT. So we economists as a profession have been complaining about drug regulation and the costs of it. Um, and there are opportunity costs. Uh, we complain about that for my lifetime and then some. Um, and we know how to analyze that. And, and we brought that to the White House um, and we worked on <laughs> getting FDA regulation out of the way. And, and the first case that FDA actually was successful in scaling itself back was on generic drug approvals. And, and so the president- part of every at, Yeah, that allowing a manufacturer to actually make a generic drug. <laughs> Is it hard to believe you have to be even approved for that? It's like the drug's been around forever. It's coming off patent. Why can't people make it? Well, you need the FDA approval. And, and that system had been gained. And so you could make tons of money making generic drugs if you could you know, get the FDA to be on your side. So that gave all of us a lot of experience with FDA deregulation, um, including the president. And then the next project we went on to, and this is in 2018, there was no COVID. Um, he said, well, what if there's a pandemic? You know, what, what's that gonna cost? Um, is there anything you can do to mitigate the cost? And we again came back to FDA. Um, and we wrote a report saying pandemics, if they come and they will come, <laughs> they're once every 20, 25 years thing. When they come, they're gonna cost a lot and you can mitigate that. And your number one way of mitigating it is speedy vaccine approval. Um, and we released a report on that. Nobody noticed, uh, but we did that. The president made an executive order. The president said in that order, 
the number one defense against pandemics is speedy vaccine approval. And then when COVID did come along, we were ready and the president was ready. Um, not just ready with the idea, we can all say speedy approval, <laughs> right. but how do you make it speedy? The bureaucracy is not a ship that you turn so easily, but the president had had his hand on the wheel and he had realized how hard he has to turn to make the thing turn. And, and he was able to get operation warp speed underway that yet yeah, it's provided money for vaccine development, but especially it sped up the approval. And they, uh, it's an interesting thing. How would it have been different if we hadn't brought all that background to the table and the experience of it so the president on down knew what to do when more FDA deregulation was needed? Now, I would love to see a lot more, like more deregulation on tests, um, more deregulation on some of these third and fourth vaccines. Even that vaccine, it came out by the end of the year, which Dr. Fauci said was impossible because Dr. Fauci took it for granted that you have to have a long approval process. He didn't read our report, by the way, it was his job. We sent him the report, he should have read it, but and it was before COVID, so he wasn't busy. But, um, you know, he said it couldn't be done and by the end of the year, we did it by the end of the year, but actually could have been done in May. You know, people started to receive the um, Moderna vaccine, people, not mice, in May, uh, no, in March, in March. March in fact, right. the same day that we were shutting schools here in Chicago, was this day that people were starting to get the Moderna vaccine. And no, we shouldn't have vaccinated a million people a day back then because you want to learn about the vaccine. But we should have been giving it out on a much bigger scale and allowing people to come and ask for it if they wanted in June, July, August. Um, so it, it could have been quicker. That's one of the first times I think we're going to have the opportunity cost like easily measured. We had this thing and the delay of the FDA gave us whatever, extra 400,000 deaths probably. Okay, so we need to show me that that is, you know, in expectation at least, <laughs> that a mistake would have, would have lead to, you know, or allowing people to experiment more easily with it would, would lead to, to a higher number of deaths. And, and uh, I think it's gonna be a hard time. You know, FDA is actually anti-Bayesian, by the way. Oh, I know, I know. And they, and they, they actually, it's funny because they actually are okay with Bayesian reasoning in very extreme things. There are like devices for like, cancer, you know, some terminal cancer type stuff, because they know that, that they need a speedier experimentation there. It's the same exact thing when you think for the cost that we're all facing as a nation, as a world. Uh, and, but that that's sort of the, the bureaucrats don't talk, right? They don't, they don't, they don't have the There's an opportunity for Bayesians to get involved. Um, if you can figure out how to crack that FDA, not as a Bayesian. Bayesian is very important. You don't want to say, thou shalt have a sample of 30,000. What do you mean? If the first thousand shows it's incredibly effective, do we need the next 29? Yeah, you know, I don't have to tell Bayesian how this works, right? That's not and, done. I mean, and, and, and they the, do the, the thou shalts. Right, right. And the prior, the prior you have on even these vaccines on for, for these viruses, those priors are not, you know, they're pretty clear that they're not that dangerous. If you made a mistake there, it's not gonna be so bad. <laughs> so <laughs> so that, that's where that's where I think the trade-off is just not taken into account at all. All right, so final question on the pandemic, and then we can wrap up. Again, we talked about opportunity costs, we talked about trade-offs, we talked about, so that, I think that training that you have in your mind and everything you think about, how do you, what was your sort of like impression of the progression of the pandemic? And uh, you mentioned already the stay-at-home orders without any assessment of trade-offs. Um, I mean, I've been saying that, I've been complaining, yelling, writing, whatever I could uh, throughout the pandemic about just what I thought was just unbelievable, uh, uh, naive responses that we did. How, what was your, I mean, I don't want to unbias your answer here, but what was your sort of like reaction, you know, starting in March and so on to what we did as, as a country, as, as a world, really? Well, we had to have a va had vaccine quickly. I mean, that was our view before this ever came along. And so I was relieved that that path was acknowledged early and taken. Uh, so that was a relief. But I was also disheartened knowing that all these agencies are going to not ignore the, oh, they're going to totally ignore the cost. You even had Fauci bragging when his testimony that economics is not his area, but actually, you're wrong, buddy. You I mean, you're, you were required by executive orders dating back years to assess the economic costs of your regulations. But he brags, he was bragging about how he doesn't even have a clue. Uh, and so you knew this, these were going to be done without regard to the costs. 
Um, so I wasn't surprised that that played out that way. I'd say the thing that surprised me was the schools. That even today, I mean, we're, we're here on February 1st, you said, and the schools aren't open in the city of Chicago. I mean, that, that is ridiculous. Um, and I guess I didn't appreciate, you know, that there's, there's some interest groups who will just step on children to, to, for just a couple dollar gain for themselves. Um, it's not even clear the, the, the gains here. It's, that's, yeah. that's what's really crazy to me. It's not even clear to me. I see, I know that teachers unions are the reason why schools are not open. But like, right. why? They're working from home in some ways. And exactly, but the difference probably is like a convenience gain. It's like minuscule probably. It's a minuscule thing when they're willing to step on the kid to get it. And that's, I wouldn't have predicted. That, is, it, is, it, is, it, is it maybe like a, just like a, a, a misreading completely of the risk that they face? Are they really that? It's not really, right? Because they're living their lives otherwise. I think most people are living their lives going out and whatever. So that's not. Um, well, I mean, it's that old saying that you're paid to, when you're paid to not understand something, then you're going to not understand it. So I'm sure they're not taking a field trip to the local Catholic school to see how they're doing. Um, yeah. You know, in a private sector, you have an incentive to pay attention. Well, how are my competitors doing? What, what are they doing good that I can imitate? What are they doing bad that I can avoid? Um, so I don't know what's in their hearts, but I know that there's incentives to have barriers to entry into their hearts and their minds. Right. Well, and you saw that very clearly in places where they tried to force this, the private schools not to open either. Uh, you had that in California, you had that. I mean, one of the extreme yeah. examples of this was not in the US, is in Portugal. Um, they outlaw online learning for private schools. So they said, no, you cannot do it because the, private, the public schools are not gonna do it because they were fighting like, well, that's not our job to do this online thing. So then the government came in and said, all right, the private schools cannot do either. To, to wow. let, and and, and that, that was like, you know, I think there was a somehow constitutionally that was overturned in, in Portugal, but like you see the extremes to which I think people with special interests will go um, uh, to protect their, their, their. I'm a little surprised by that too, um, that this is done while we're all watching. I kind of figure that kind of stuff happens when we're not watching, but they do it while we're watching. I, it shows how little power we have. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I, I, that was awakening year for me in terms of like our professions, I think just, I don't know, I, I'm very disheartened in a lot of ways. Positive in other ways too. I think that the, the fact that 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 uh, warp speed is a great example of how the power of economics coming in and, and helping. Um, and I wish more we take more of that and, and other of the of the other side. But anyway, Casey, thank you so much. It was great. We, we ran over over time already. Uh, great conversation. I look forward to your talk this afternoon.